Chris, come on, sit down. You're about to hear from the most wonderful U.S. Senator in the country. Yeah! <laughs> I, have, I really, as you can tell, I am excited and honored to be introducing our first speaker this morning, U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon. Um, yeah, well, let's go ahead and Senator Merkley has championed union workers. He's fought for the success of Oregon and America's working families. And that means fighting for good jobs, strong public schools, affordable college, and health care. He has been a consistent ally in the fight to address climate change, to protect the rights of working people, to improve America's infrastructure, and build a just economy for all Oregonians and Americans. Since taking office, Senator Merkley has fought to address the most important issue of our time, climate change, or as he says, climate disruption, while making sure Oregon's workers aren't left behind. Senator Merkley has introduced two bills, Keep It in the Ground and 100 by 50, that would curb the extraction and use of fossil fuels and help Americans at the grassroots level transition to using 100% renewable energy by 2050. These bills would also provide job training in the clean energy sector, would help people who work in today's fossil fuel economy to find good jobs in growth industries of the future, and would create thousands and thousands of new, good-paying, family-sustaining jobs. And in his role as, Senate Appro as on the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Merkley has worked to provide significant resources for union workers in Oregon and across the nation, including investing in nursing, healthcare workers, funding timber, economy innovations, and preserving funding for agencies that protect workers' wages and rights. Senator Merkley led the passage of the Water Infrastructure Financing Act to help local communities replace aging sewer and drinking water systems, and he expanded Buy America programs so that taxpayer money is used on American steel and other materials whenever possible. Uh, just recently, he introduced the Job Creation Through Energy Efficient Manufacturing Act um, which is endorsed by the Blue Green Alliance and it also includes a Buy America clause. Senator Merkley is a native Oregonian, the son of a millwright. He was born in rural Oregon in Rural Creek and his family moved with the timber economy to Roseburg and then to a blue collar neighborhood in the Portland area. It's my great pleasure to introduce our friend, a champion for a clean and fair economy and my personal hero, a <laughs> U.S. Senator yeah. Jeff Merkley. for arranging for the smoke to be blown away so we can all breathe. As I was uh, flying in last night to Portland, we hit about the 10,000 foot level and just immediately everyone in the plane went because oh, the smoke came right into the right into the plane as we were flying, which I didn't didn't anticipate would, a, would, a, would occur. It's like, okay, well, yes, we have these raging forest fires, which do have a little relevance to the topic that we're, we're addressing today that I'll, I'll get to. The mission, the mission of the Blue Green Alliance to identify ways today's environmental challenges can create and maintain quality jobs and build a stronger and fairer economy. Well, so we have a labor economy that is uh, hurting. I'm going to say a bit about that. And we have an environment that has a massive challenge. And I'll say something about that. And then uh, about how, if we aggressively take on the challenge, we can also help heal our labor economy. So that's the, that's the gist of what I wanted to share with you. Okay, so that was the short version, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but we have an opportunity to make an America that works a lot better for working Americans. And that's, that's the goal. And the last four decades have not been, been good. Now my, my father was a millwright, a mechanic, a proud labor union machinist, and on that single, any machinists here? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, on that single working wage, uh, we lived the American dream. My, my parents were able to, to buy a home. They were able to have a car. They were able to have annual vacations. The modest, they were mostly, they were mostly we were camping vacations, which I absolutely loved. They were able to save 
money for retirement and to have a modest uh, union uh, pension and just build a strong foundation for their, their kids. It's the stability of a full-time living wage job. Honest days pay, honest days work, in large part because my father was able to be part of a union. And generally we saw this massive leap forward. If I turn the clock back, at one point my grandmother, my mother's mother, was uh, during the depression, was, was living in a box car and uh, taking in hand, wa hand washing laundry to, to try to, to survive. And uh, my grandfather was um, uh, making home, home brew and, and playing poker to keep the family uh, afloat. <laughs> so, oh, it, this is a big transition in a, in a generation. Those were three pretty golden decades for workers, 1945 through 1975, in which workers were really able to fully participate in the growth of wealth that they were, were creating. But um, 1975 till now, four decades plus, the story's not so good. And we've seen flat wages for, for workers. We have often seen declining wages for workers. We have seen a relentless attack on the right and ability to organize, going back to the Reagan administration forward. Uh, since the early 80s, our union membership has dropped in percentage terms by more than half. In um, January of this year, Kentucky became the 27th state in the union to uh, become a union-busting right-to-work-for-less state. So we're over half the states have, have done that. And um, Iowa legislature this last year, they decided to take on the, the public unions and, and dismantle them. They created an annual certification process in which the voting pool is the non-union members and the union members, but anyone who doesn't show up to vote is counted as a no vote for certification. And they banned payroll deductions to pay you. You can't pay your union dues through a payroll deduction. And they struck down the ability to bargain over anything but initial salary, benefits, vacations, family leave, uh, you name it. And the construction unions are worried that those provisions will migrate into the non-public union world uh, with uh, uh, you know, would be terrible impact. We have the pensions under under assault. And then we have uh, all the jobs getting shipped overseas. And I just, you know, um, kind of set up a little question here. Jonathan's sitting down here in the, the first row. My son's named Jonathan, so I'm going to uh, pick you out. Jonathan, if you are running a company in a country where there's no wage laws, you can pay a dollar an hour, and no environmental laws or no enforcement, so you can pollute as much as you want. Uh, and I have a competing factory in the United States. Now, who's going to make things for less? Me or you? <laughs> you. And you are overseas. And uh, so that means my factory is going to go out of business. What is so hard for us to understand that if we give our overseas competitors this massive advantage over our American manufacturers, that our factories are going to shut down. I mean, it's not some theory that we've had no evidence on the ground. We've lost 50,000 factories. We've lost more than 5 million factory workers. And the, the proponents of this uh, diabolical scheme, primarily funded by uh, multinational companies that want to make things at the lowest price anywhere in the world and sell them in America, they say, oh, look, look, this is an equal deal. They get access to our market, and we get access to their market. <laughs> Sounds even deal. But Jonathan, if you can make things so much less than I can make things, aren't you going to have an advantage in your own country as well as in my country? Yes. <laughs> I'll help you out here. <laughs> and therefore, it becomes a lose-lose dynamic for the American worker. And here's the thing, if we don't make things in America, we're not going to have a middle class in America. That's why we have to fight to make things here in the United States. And 
you don't just lose those factory drives. Those factories have a whole supply chain that wants to be close by, located close by. And therefore, those supply chains shut down. You may not be as visible as the big factory going down. It may be five jobs here and 10 jobs here, but a steady loss of supply chain jobs. And then we have another level of loss because the payrolls from those factory workers and those payrolls from the supply chain workers, those disappear. And that affects jobs throughout our retail, our stores, and so on and so forth. And so uh, we're, we're triple cursed uh, by these trade treaties like NAFTA and CAFTA and SHAFTA. Oh, wait, that's, the, that's, that's the one that was, we, we stopped this last year, the TPP. Thank you for fighting the people. So in the course of it, since our recovery from the 2008 recovery, we have seen virtually all the new income in America go to the top 10%, the expansion of income. And let's take a look at how this, what this done to wealth inequality. The one-tenth of the top 1% own as much as the bottom 90% in America. This makes us look more like a Central American dictatorship than it does an advanced, developed, democratic republic. In a country founded on we the people, how is it possible that we've allowed these laws to be manifested that do so much damage to we the people? And we have to change that. I really love that the, the, the founders wrote our constitution with those words in supersized font. <laughs> you know, if you're across the room and you can't read all the details of that constitution <laughs> on the wall, you can still read the mission statement, we the people. Or as Lincoln summarized, of the people, by the people, for the people. Jefferson. Jefferson said that the mother principle of our democracy is that each citizen has an equal voice. Now, we, were, we know there were huge defects in that vision for women and for African Americans and for Native Americans. Uh, we worked to fill in those defects, but the concept was that the power in a democracy has to be equally distributed, not concentrated. And that's the opposite of what we have now with a certain vision referred to by the Supreme Court of passing Citizens United. You've heard of Citizens United? Yeah. No, 5-4 decision. A 5-4 decision that said it's okay for the mega billionaires to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in third party campaigns across the country. And in 2014, the Koch brothers uh, took advantage of this. And the Koch brothers said, well, you know, in one year, our personal wealth went up by $10 billion. I guess we can spend a few hundred million dollars taking control of the U.S. Senate. And they focused on campaigns in Arkansas and Louisiana and North Carolina and Iowa and Colorado and Alaska. And they won all those seats. By the way, they came to Oregon started attacking me, uh, and uh, they use these front groups, like things like Generation Opportunity. <laughs> how wonderful does that sound? <laughs> Generation Opportunity, how great, and other front groups, uh, veterans groups, and so forth. And I could see what's happening across the country, and I said to my campaign team, I said, we're going to attack them here in Oregon. And my team said, bad idea because you don't pick fights the old, as the old expression goes with uh, groups that buy ink by the barrel well in this case the the Hill brothers could choose to put another 10 another 20 another 50 million dollars into a state senate race a u.s senate race without 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 blinking and my team also said don't do it because people won't understand the Koch brother name is not on those third party ads that they fund through these front groups. And I said, you know, if I'm gonna go down because of these folks, I'm gonna go down swinging. So I put up an ad. Yeah. And it said, out of state oil and coal billionaires have come to Oregon to elect my opponent, Monica Webby, because they share an agenda. I listed three agenda items that they had both endorsed. It's a great investment for the Koch brothers, terrible choice for Oregon. 
and uh, it was you know the Coles wasn't wasn't like it's like terrible choice for Oregon. Uh, when saying they're terrible people, but uh, <laughs> terrible choice. And uh, but the imagery was great on the on the television app. It did make it look like terribly uh, sneaky, underhanded, diabolical operation, which it was. Uh, and I must say, after a month, they left Oregon. Thank you to everyone in the Northwest helping kick the Coke brothers out of Oregon. And when it comes to politics, you got to kick them out of Oregon. <laughs> So life is a lot tougher in the blue-collar community. I still live in the same blue-collar community that I was in from third grade through high school. It's on the very east edge of, of, of Portland. Uh, it's, uh, it's struggling. It doesn't have much property tax base uh, for its schools. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's, 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 it's a tough community. But I'll tell you, at the time I was a kid, families were doing a lot better. They were able to buy these three-bedroom ranch ranch homes with a single car garage and they were able to go on annual vacations it was easier it was easier to get a full-time job easier to get a living wage job now it's tougher a lot tougher in the same neighborhood a lot tougher for folks to get a full-time job a lot tougher to get a living wage job and when it comes to buying a home many of the families in my community are thinking the only way that I'm going to own a home is to inherit it from my parents. And that's a whole different uh, dynamic for a, a neighborhood. And I think it reflects what's happened this last uh, four decades. Now it isn't that the wealth in America didn't continue to go up, it went up at the same rate. I mean, it has gone up enormously over the last four decades. It's just that workers have not gotten to share in that wealth in the same way to these forces that we're, we're talking about the attack on organization and unions, the movement of our manufacturing jobs overseas. So that's on the labor side. We're fighting, but we haven't been winning a lot of these, these, these fights. And uh, then let's talk about the environmental challenge. So since Oregon is home, I tend to think about what I'm seeing on the ground in Oregon. Uh, one thing I'm seeing is that the uh, change in the climate is very good for pine beetles and very bad for trees of course we have a, we have a lot of trees and uh, the average snowpack in the cascades has been dropping uh and that has affected the fishing in the in the streams they're warmer they're smaller in klamath falls i was asked at a town hall i do a town hall in every county every year two-thirds of those counties are dark red counties so i i hear a lot about what's on on fox news and and what they're getting in their email feeds and so forth and uh, the uh, individual says, uh, you know, uh, how can you be fighting for jobs and also being concerned about climate change? And I use the term climate disruption, as, as Barbara mentioned, climate change. And I said, uh, how many people here fish? And everybody raised their hands at that town hall. Half because they fish, and half because they didn't want to admit they don't fish. <laughs> So I said, so you've seen that these streams are smaller and warmer. And they're like, yes. And we've had three worst ever droughts in the last 15 years here in the Klamath. And it's really hurting our farmers and really hurting our ranchers. Yes. And you know about the pine beetles and the red zone, which if you've driven through it, you just can't believe how much forest has been wiped out by pine beetles. Yes, they know about it. What about the oysters on the Oregon coast? We lost a billion oysters in 2007, 2008, baby oysters. Not because... It was a, an affliction by a bacteria, not because it was a virus. Eventually, it turned out it was simply the acidity of the Pacific Ocean has increased by 30%. And that acidity makes it harder for the baby oysters, the very beginning of their life, to start making a shell. And the effort to do so, they die. Because of the higher amount of carbonic acid that comes from the carbon dioxide from burning fuels. Same thing, I was flipping through channels, and I don't know, it must have been about a year and a half ago, I saw the, uh, the uh, governor here, Governor Inslee of Washington, over at the oyster hatchery in the Washington coast, talking about the same set of circumstances. It was an anomaly just in, in, uh, in, in Oregon. And then we see, it, we see it nationally. We see Glacier National Park, 150 glaciers when our parents were born. Now there's 25. And 20 years is anticipated it'll be zero. 
the moose in, in uh, Minnesota. They're dying from the ticks. I don't know if you've seen these pictures of a big ball of ticks on the butt of a moose. If you see it, you'll go, oh my goodness, why didn't you show me that? <laughs> and the skeletal moose, and they're, because it's not cold enough to kill the ticks in the, in the winter. In Maine, they're worried about losing their lobsters to Canada because they're cold water lobsters and they're migrating, they're migrating north. And the list goes on and on and on. Zika expanding, so on and so forth. Uh, we see the Canadian permafrost melting. We have uh, coral reefs around the world dying. We have the Arctic ice disappearing. Last year, 2016, was the first year that a luxury cruise ship went through the Arctic. And it went through again this year, and it's the same ship. It's called Crystal Serenity. Yeah. I'm sure things seemed very yeah. serene as this ship was passing through that expanse in, in the Arctic. But at the same time it was passing through that Arctic, Hurricane Harvey was forming. And behind it, Hurricane Irma. And our, our forests here in the Northwest, from Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, down to California, uh, were lighting up on, on fire. So no serenity here from, from these, these factors. And while any individual storm can't be blamed simply on the changing circumstances, in general these storms are worse because the water in the ocean is warmer and it feeds the energy in the hurricane. Five years ago I, I went down and, and uh, was uh, swimming in a triathlon uh, in the Atlantic Ocean and the first person ahead of me who tested out the water said, oh, I can't believe how warm the water is. And I'm thinking, it's supposed to be 62 degrees. And how warm can it be? So I walk in and I go, whoa, this is comfortable. It was 72 degrees. And a week later, Hurricane Sandy, feeding on that warm water, assaulted the east coast of the United States of, of, of America. And the forest, again, we've had fires all my life. But we have more lightning strikes with the type of storms we have now. And we have drier conditions on the floor of the forest. Drier than a kiln dry 2 by 4 That combination is deadly as we, we, we've seen. There was a report, uh, the draft report from the Department of Energy, the uh, Secretary Moniz was telling me about it in uh, a year ago. Uh, I don't know if it was ever published, but we had a copy of the draft. And it showed a chart of the anticipated loss of forest coverage from pine beetles and forest fires through now through the end, end of the century. And what it basically showed, we'd lose half of our forest by the end of this, this century in the Pacific Northwest. And that's more believable when you think about what we're seeing, the fires we're seeing uh, right now and the red zones that we're seeing right now. And behind all of this uh, is carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. You can do it, you can check in the laboratory, you can check in on the planet, you can look at it historically going back hundreds of thousands of years because they can, they can find bubbles of air and see what the temperature and what the uh, um, carbon dioxide level was going back and they track each other uh, up and down. And uh, the, the change has been very, very significant. We've gone from 270 parts per million 150 years ago uh, to now we're over 400. Uh, and um, we were going up at one part per million per year 20 years ago. Now we're going up at two parts per million. In the last two years, we've gone up at three parts per million. So the rate of global carbon pollution is accelerating. It's not tailoring off. So whereas we need to be able to say, hey, we hit that 400 and we're going to come back down to 350, instead, it's accelerating at an even faster rate, which a recent study out of um, EPA last, well, last year, because they wouldn't have issued it this year, <laughs> would not have, ex the scientists would not have been allowed to say, so, okay, here in the Pacific Northwest, our temperature has gone up one and a half degrees over the previous background level. And it's anticipated that three decades from now, three decades from now, it will triple that. If we see these impacts from 1.5 degrees, what's going to happen when we've gone up 4.5 degrees three decades from now? And it's expected to double again by the end of the century, uh, nine degrees. Uh, so we're running a race and we're losing uh, that race. 
And it means we have to think of energy conservation in all the ways that we've thought about it. A little more mileage, a little more insulation, double plane double paned windows, energy efficient appliances. That's okay. But we also have to think far more boldly, far more dramatically in terms that we must stop burning fossil fuels. And we have to do it in the next three decades to have a chance to take this on. And we have to do it in partnership with the world. We have to completely transform our energy economy. And that sounds, that's a very scary thing to, to lay out there. Because we have a lot of jobs invested in our current energy economy. But what we're seeing is a change is already underway due to some technologies that actually set aside the whole issue of climate disruption, set aside the whole thing. We're still going to go through this revolution in the energy economy because it is now less expensive or at least cost competitive, and in many cases starting to be less expensive, to have new kilowatts come from solar energy than from coal or gas. It's becoming cheaper to have new kilowatts come from wind energy than from coal or gas. So in states that are, refuse to have any conversation about climate disruption, it's not happening, they haven't seen anything, well, everything's fine, they're still transforming their energy economy. Well, Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, senator from Tennessee, he hates wind turbines. He owns some, I think, a vacation house up in the northeast, and he doesn't want wind turbines that he has to look at. And he doesn't want to look at them in Tennessee. Uh, that's my understanding. Uh, so he wanted to cut the research on wind turbines. So I said, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Senator Grassley from Iowa, you have a lot of wind energy. Oh, yeah, we're leading the nation in, in, in wind energy. More per capita wind energy. I said, well, you think we should keep funding research to do even more, better, cheaper. He said, oh yes, oh yes. So he partnered with me on a, and we rescued the, the research funding that, that Senator Lamar Alexander had eliminated. Not because Senator Grassley would admit for one second that there's anything <laughs> changing in the world. <laughs> but he sure likes that wind energy. <laughs> those rural counties are getting a lot of tax property, property taxes from those, those turbines. Those rural farmers are getting a whole lot of money. They, they have more money to spend in the local economy. We see that in parts of, of uh, Oregon and Washington where the, the wind turbines have, have uh, been put forward. So there is a change that's already underway. It's going to be massive. And we have a choice either to seize it and try to make it the best possible opportunity for American workers or to not seize it, and in that case, it'll be a great opportunity for workers overseas. That's right. I'd rather have that opportunity for American workers. We have a huge opportunity to increase the economy in ways that work for working Americans. Let's do it. Right. We have huge manufacturing potential for the components and products that go into this renewable energy economy. We have huge opportunity for constructing utility scale and distributed scale solar and wind. We have R&D going on on fusion and on small modular reactors, which if successful could create a whole nother world of, of opportunity for, for workers. We have high voltage electric lines that need to be, to be constructed. Uh, reinforcement of uh, local grids. We have residential reconstruction, changing for everything from changing hot water heaters and, and gas furnace and oil furnaces into uh, heat pumps to installing uh, energy saving windows and, and doors. When I was first elected, I had a bill called Rural Energy Savings Program. And it was a, the goal was to enable rural electrical co-ops to do low cost loans on their electric bills so people could say, hey, I can't afford to put in a bunch of double pane windows, but if I can get a loan on my electric bill at virtually 0%, 1% or 2%, I can then replace those windows and I'll pay for it with the savings 
um, that I save in heat. It's a win-win. So uh, I had this bill, and I was advocating for it, and, and uh, former President Bill Clinton comes into our caucus. And he comes in and he says, okay, I can't imitate him. <laughs> <laughs> Single best. <laughs> Single best way you can create jobs in America is through low-cost loans on electric bills for people to retrofit their businesses and their homes. And then he made my whole argument for me. <laughs> like, virtually all of these, virtually all of these <laughs> products are made here in America. They're made in America, so there's virtually no link to relief. All the work has to be done by the construction workers here in America on these commercial projects, on these residential uh, projects. And uh, the whole time, I'm sending him mind waves. I'm like, okay, now say, and the bill. <laughs> this topic was introduced by the new senator from Oregon. <laughs> Come on, Bill, help me out here. <laughs> Uh, and he didn't help me out. He didn't know that we had a bill that we were advocating to do exactly this. Well, it took a few years, but I did get that bill passed. And uh, we got the first funding for it last year. And we have our first uh, rural electrical co-op signing up to, uh, to get these loans and be able to do it. Uh, they, they're really worried about the difficulty of reprogramming their software to make this, and, you know, the billing go out automatically. They're not really in the lending business, so it's, you know, it's a bit of a hurdle. But hopefully they will uh, proceed to, to continue. So we have all these different areas in which uh, jobs can be created. We are seeing the renewable energy economy grow 12 times faster than the rest of the economy. We have seen in a single year, 2015 to 2016, the solar jobs jumped 25% in the United States of, of America. We now have 260,000 Americans working in the, in the solar world. We have a Kentucky coal company, Berkeley Energy Group, that is now planning the largest Kentucky solar uh, field on top of a former strip mine. And they have a provision. They have a provision in there that says that the jobs will go to former coal workers. And the whole coal community is so excited about this project. Our coal workers and our fossil fuel workers have been powering our economy for 150 years. They have been the foundation for our thriving economy we have today, for the standard of living we have today. We have to make sure that as we seize the opportunity to create jobs in a new rural and energy economy that we make sure our fossil fuel workers are at the front of the line. I did find that attitudes are really changing when I heard that Kentucky's coal museum yeah. had put eight solar panels on the floor. <laughs> so we see this low cost of solar, low cost of wind driving this. Uh, I was. Um, uh, over a meeting with the power minister of, of India. And he says, first of all, he wanted to tell me about America burning fossil fuels for 150 years, so why should we ask India to do anything? Uh, so he, I let him, he, he, had, he, had, he told the story, and it wasn't inaccurate, about mm -hmm. our use of fossil fuels. That's, that's absolutely true. And uh, then I said, you know, looking forward, how much does it cost to do a new kilowatt of coal power? Seven cents. How much for a new kilowatt in India of solar power? Three cents. I said, so we don't need to argue about the past. Let's look at the future. Where is the world going to go? And how can you create more power faster for the 300 million people in, in India that don't have electricity? Didn't want to say that. Well, solar, right? <laughs> I said no. We have to. We have to build another hundred or so coal power plants, um, and we have to move fast. And uh, said, well, you can move fast on solar too. And but that was in April. In June, what did the power minister of India announce? We're not building any more coal plants. <laughs> We have 540,000 plug-in electric vehicles in, in America. And so that's now starting to be 
a small share of our total vehicles. After all, we sold 17 million vehicles last year, so 500,000 is selling so many. Uh, the, uh, but it is enough to, for us to start to understand how, how these uh, plug-in vehicles work. And uh, I uh, bought a Chevy Volt designed in America and made in America five years ago. Yay. I made my last payment on it this week. So I got it. <laughs> the bank, we do not own my Chevy Volt anymore. <laughs> it is mine. And uh, it was way too expensive to buy because we make so, so few of them. The price is going to start coming down. But I'll tell you this, it's a hell of a lot cheaper to, to drive. The cost of my former car was about 20 cents a mile for gas and oil. My Chevy Volt on electricity, it also has, you can drive on gas as well, but on electricity, it's three cents a mile. It cost me three cents a mile to drive that. Well, that stacks up. You're driving 10,000 miles a year and you're saving 20 cents a mile, that's, you know, that's uh, $2,000 a year you're saving on, on, on fuel. So that, you know what, after five years, I've saved $10,000. It was almost, almost a square deal. <laughs> Still too expensive, but uh, but we are seeing uh, uh, so much change in this. Uh, India has announced it's not going to sand, sell fossil fuel cars after 2030. Yeah. Yeah. France announced it's not, and UK announced they're not going to sell after 2040. Last week, China announced that they are going to stop <laughs> selling fossil fuel cars at a date they're going to figure out in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, Meanwhile, they are pushing ahead and trying to seize the world manufacturing of electric vehicles. They're trying to seize that. Now, I was very struck about Norway. Norway did some things like free parking for EVs. They lowered the highway fees, the annual registration fee. Uh, they put in more charging stations. And in about a four-year period, they went from 5% of their vehicles being sold being EVs to now 40%. 40% last year were registered were EVs. That's a dramatic transformation. Well, so we're back to the big question. Is the US going to lead this economic revolution and sell our products to the world and sell our technology to the world? Or are we simply going to be buying the products from other countries? And I'm very worried about where we are in this equation. Now. The Koch brothers, they employ a lot of folks and a lot of union folks. And there's a lot of jobs in our fossil fuel industry. But those jobs are going to keep changing for the reasons I've described. But meanwhile, the Koch brothers are hurting us by slowing down American leadership in seizing the opportunity to have jobs in this field. Let me give you an example. This week, General Motors announced that it is moving its design team for electric cars to China. That's a, that's a knife in my heart. Why? Because China is investing heavily in car changing stations, char car charging, and they are pushing their automakers to embrace batter battery powered vehicles. And here's the diabolical part. They are requiring American, European, and Japanese companies to hand over their technology to their Chinese partners in this field. We've seen this play out, this movie play out time and time again. American manufacturer goes to China to get inside uh, and potentially sell to that, that economy as it becomes more affluent. The Chinese partner gets the technology and the American company gets shut down. That is incredibly damaging. And if we're allowing China access to a market, which we shouldn't allow in a way that produces a trade deficit in the manufacturing, we sure as hell shouldn't let them extract as a cost of doing business in China as stealing our technology. This is going to severely wound working America in the future. It's an issue we have to go to battle on. It isn't just the trade deficit, which is unacceptable. It is also the fact that conditions are setting on U.S. companies going, stealing our technology and taking the lead, and they are trying to do this on the clean energy economy. They believe the future is in solar and wind and electric cars. And they are subsidizing it and pushing forward 
We cannot let them beat us. Let's make sure America owns this energy revolution. Yeah. Scott Pruitt said, now is not the right time to talk about climate disruption. <laughs> Let me just say, every moment is now the right time to talk about it. Warming acidic oceans, dying coral reefs, surging storms, raging fires, and a huge opportunity if we seize it. If we don't talk about it, we're not going to seize it. So, I introduced a bill this year, the 100 by 50 bill, and it basically says, let's seize this opportunity. We can be at the forefront of making these products. We can be at the forefront of developing the market so people want to produce the, the things here, we make it cheaper here, we can sell it to the world. We can make sure our fossil fuel workers get first shot at jobs and get a fair transition. We can make sure our disadvantaged communities have a chance to have that clean and renewable energy in their communities, because they're often the most polluted communities. We can make sure that they have an opportunity at the, the jobs. We can work incredibly hard to make sure that workers have the right to organize in this new economy so they get a fair share of the way So I want to keep fighting in D.C. We know that the Koch brothers now, at this moment, control the U.S. Senate, so we're not going to make a lot of progress on my bill, 100 by 50, but the vision we should carry forward and carry that fight at every state level. And it's happening in Oregon, where there's an effort underway to uh, adopt a bold piece of climate legislation. And here in Washington State, where the legislature set targets for greenhouse gas reductions. And in California, on to this day, the State Assembly is voting, the Senate already passed it in California, is, is voting on a 100% renewable energy bill to help put California at the forefront of this transition and create jobs in California. So we also can think of uh, our local nonprofits and businesses and colleges doing 100% resolutions and proceeding to have action plans. That will help drive this economy, help us own this, this economy. Well, in close, um, Bobby Kennedy said, if we fail to dare, if we do not try, the next generation will harvest the fruit of our indifference. A world we did not want, a world we did not choose, and a world we could have made better. Let's apply ourselves now to taking on climate disruption, but taking on a much better economy where workers share in the wealth they create here in the United States of America. Thank you very much. Casey Golden, Senior Policy Advisor, Climate Solutions, Co-Chair, Washington Blue Green Alliance. Good morning, everybody. I have a I have a politically astute friend who has a theory about 2020, and that is that uh, the reaction to the um, personality traits of our current president is going to lead us to elect someone who is the diametrical opposite, someone who's calm someone who is thoughtful, someone who's reassuring, someone who uh, is compassionate and smart and does his homework. I'm just saying, Oregon's got a great senator, so uh, I, don't, no, not, I, I, I don't want to go anywhere. But. Senator Merkley, thank you so much for being with us. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce the first and only human being in the history of the world to represent Washington's 10th Congressional District. <laughs> a man who, he reminded me recently, has no predecessor, a true original, 
uh, in uh, this this first district, which which was really truly created for Denny Heck. Uh, um, we are very fortunate to have him. He uh, uh, is a member of Congress. He was uh, in our state legislature for many years, where he was at one time uh, House Majority Leader. He served as uh, Chief of Staff to Governor Booth Gardner. He founded uh, TVW, our public access TV uh, station. And uh, I, have a, I have a little personal story about him that I am quite sure he won't remember. I was running a small nonprofit and I managed to score a very valuable meeting time with the uh, then uh, Chief of Staff to Governor Booth Gardner. And I got in there and to my disappointment, he, he told me right away, or maybe his staff told me, I'm sorry, you know, the Chief of Staff's gonna, he can meet with you for a minute, but he's really gonna have to go. It's just a really tough schedule. And I tried to be, you know, understanding about it. And I said, well, th you know, thank you for taking a few minutes. I know, I know how busy you are. I know how tough your schedule is. You must just be going crazy. And he looked at me and said, I'm going to the Mariners game. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> um, I uh, got to uh, teach a class with him recently at, at Evergreen College, and I was just reminded, I, 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 you know, the last thing I want to say about Denny is, when you work on climate change as long as I have, you, you have to sort of become an amateur psychologist. And I'm convinced that, you know, people ask me all the time, well, you know, what the hell with all the denial after all this however many decades of, of good science on this stuff. And I'm convinced that some of it is, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a human efficacy problem. It's, there's nothing that you can do within your scope of effectiveness that's personally, that's gonna matter at the scope of a problem that big, which is why we create big public institutions to tackle big challenges and do great things that we can only do together. Um, but the one bipartisan consensus we may have in this country is that our public institutions, particularly at the federal level, are looking not so robust, not so capable, not so likely to take on these big challenges together. And I think that's part of why people take a big challenge like climate and put it in the darkest possible corner of their minds. Because where are those tools, those, those institutions, those means for us to do the big great things we have to do together? And that is why it is so important that, and, and so valuable and so, you know, uh, unfortunately not common enough that we are represented by people like Jeff Merkley and Denny Heck, who show us what it looks like to be, um, you know, just a model of competent, brave, focused public service. It is hard to serve in the U.S. Congress right now, and we we see our representatives come home too many times, and sometimes, you know, they get off the plane and they know they got to get up back on the plane Monday morning, and and it it, it shows, and and uh, and and it's tough, but. Every single time I see Congressman Denny Hagg, I get the sense that he is ready, that the next morning he is gonna put on his tool belt and he is not gonna take no for an answer no matter how hard it gets in the United States Congress. And I'll just tell you, as somebody who works in communities and at smaller levels of government, having that sense that we are represented by people who are not gonna quit, who are gonna pull our institutions together to address this kind of challenge, um, I think is a big part of what keeps us fueled as as activists, as community members, and uh, we're just we're just so grateful for your leadership, Congressman Denny Heck. time I've been introduced by music. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. Very kind comments. I'm, I'm humble. Honored to be here and be a part of your second day. Uh, I'm just generally humble, frankly, to serve as the first and only member of the 10th Congressional District. A lot of people don't understand how humbling it is to serve in the House of Representatives. It's unbelievably humbling, and I can prove it to you. Uh, I got on an airplane last year, actually, to fly from SeaTac to Washington, D.C. Now, the only two things you need to know about this story are that I live here in Olympia. And by the way, welcome to the 10th Congressional District. <laughs> and that I serve, at least for another 15 months, with a guy named Dave Riker. I live in Olympia, I serve with Dave Riker. Get on the airplane, seated in my usual slot, 7A, aisle seat, tiny bladder. <laughs> 
woman gets in the middle seat next to me. I don't know her. We don't even make eye contact. People are coming onto the plane. We don't talk. No eye contact. Plane's filling up. All of a sudden, she literally breathlessly grabs my right arm and says, Oh, look, there's Congressman Riker. <laughs> So, I asked the obvious, do you, do you live in Congressman Reichert's district? She says, no, I live in Olympia. <laughs> <laughs> do you know who your member of Congress is? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Opening. <laughs> Opening. <laughs> Puffed up, chin, chest out a little bit, kind of a little smug smirk, maybe even on my face. I go, well... His name is Denny Heck. <laughs> she says, no, that's not it. <laughs> I don't have a problem staying humble in this job. <laughs> Who's in charge of weather today, by the way? Whoever that was, you should give them a hand. <laughs> this is pretty spectacular. Uh, I am very, very appreciative of the opportunity to be here with you today and talk about something that I care as much as I do about. I know you already heard from Jeff Johnson. Jeff, I hope I embarrass you. I'm going to try. Uh, I, just, I just want to acknowledge Jeff and his leadership in the Blue Green Alliance. Uh, this is important. And Jeff's led the way, and he's, I think, really helped cultivate at the state level what this is about, along with Casey, of course. But with all due respect to Casey, <laughs> whose leadership I've admired for years. And no, I don't remember that damned untrue story you just told. You know, coming together, finding consensus, making progress. It's not always easy when you occupy the chair that Jeff Johnson does. It's not easy. And so, Jeff, hats off. Uh, I got a chance to work with Jeff a couple of years ago to push back against the Koch brothers to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. Thank you, Jeff, very much for that. We beat them then, and we're going to beat them again. Yeah. That, was, uh, that was important work I did as a consequence of my membership on the Financial Services Committee. But this year, as I entered my third term in Congress, feels like my 22nd, um, I knew I wanted to sit on another committee. So I ended up getting appointed to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And I guess I don't have to tell you that the work that we do there, especially with respect to the Russian investigation, is of great importance and urgency, but doesn't always directly focus on clean energy or a fair economy. But, but, I tell this everywhere I go and I invite you to do the same, climate change is a national security threat. And it's going to continue to be, frankly, as long as oil influences geopolitics to the degree it does, and especially with regard to countries where we have economic sanctions restricting exports of energy sources. There's no question, spoiler alert, statement of the obvious coming, <laughs> there's no question that climate change isn't exactly a popular topic among congressional leadership and in this White House. Uh, we ask them to focus on science. They wage war on it all day. We ask them to make investments. They'd rather talk about cutting regulations. But even with this animosity from those in charge, my essential takeaway message for today is I remain optimistic we can get some good stuff done. I am very optimistic, and I want to explain it to you. I don't believe that you can go forward with a sense of purpose and commitment necessary to be successful if you don't look back a little bit. So let's look back just a little bit to the economic recession of 2008, 2009. That was a pretty dark time. Jobs disappearing literally by the minute, by the second, literally. Home values collapsing, $13 trillion in net worth wiped out just like that. Families struggled. My God, they struggled to balance all these pressures. We were facing an economy in free fall. And so what did President Obama do? What did the federal government do? They rolled up their sleeves. And they said, let's get Americans back to work in a way that looks toward the future, that is prospective. And we answered the call. Americans answered the call. It was the new New Deal 
as writer Mike Grunwald called it. It jump-started, frankly, the way we live now. Because not only was it about people and about jobs, it was about fighting our addiction to oil. It was about combating climate change and building a 21st century economy ready to compete with the rest of the world because that's the direction they're heading and we better head there too. So the new New Deal launched the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, ARPA-E. You all know that was based on the defense DARPA, which by the way was a fairly effective incubator for living things that influence our life today like GPS and the internet. It became, in a way, ARPA-E, the world's largest venture capital fund. It put $90 billion into things like a smart grid, energy efficiency programs, electric cars, solar power, wind power, advanced biofuels, and green manufacturing. No, they didn't all work, but a lot of them did. So before that, back in 2006, the United States imported 80% of the components of its wind turbines, 80%. Today, after the stimulus, 40%. We cut it in half, Bob Gunther. We cut it in half. <laughs> and by the way, it's important to remember the supply chain. We all have to say that term to ourselves over and over and over again, because it's so important to the economy. The supply chain, the supply chain, the supply chain. Wind turbines made in America are also full of American-made parts. American-made. Then thousands of parts go into wind turbines. So this created strong, strong new clean energy economy right here at home. Shovel-ready was replaced with shovel-worthy. Think retrofit, not renovate. We weren't rearranging the deck chairs. We were making them more comfortable, more resilient, and versatile. And the results are around us everywhere, and they speak for themselves. U.S. wind production has increased 145% since 2008. So any of you, like I, that drive east on I-90 to visit family in Spokane, see it. It's not data on a piece of paper. It's real. It's there. And it's working. Solar in installations have increased 1,200%. And that's even here in the Northwest, where the sun can sometimes play kind of hard to get. It's, it's no longer strange to have or want solar panels on your home. It's a money saver. And, fr and frankly, it significantly increases the value of your home should you go to resell. Just this week, in case you missed it, by golly, you're hearing it here first, the U.S. Department of Energy announced that the U.S., has met President Obama's goal of slashing the cost of solar power to six cents per kilowatt hours three years ahead of schedule. So the Recovery Act invested in projects that would benefit our economy and the energy sec sector for a long time. This is my favorite data point. I was, I was afraid Senator Merkley shared every data point on the face of the planet with you. I think he saved this one for me. Thank you, Jeff. The Department of Energy estimates that more than 3.3 million Americans are now directly employed in the clean energy industry, which is now more than the fossil fuel industry. And those numbers keep going up. So we can build on that progress. We can build on it and get even closer to what we have to get to, which is a low carbon economy. And it's clear to me, and I hope it's clear to each and every one of you as well, what the next step must be. A huge, decades overdue investment in our nation's crumbling infrastructure. Decades overdue. I don't need to convince you of the benefits of doing that, of infrastructure spending, creation of good paying jobs, both in the short term and in the long term, lowering costs for businesses and for consumers in cities and in rural communities. Those are the benefits. Let me just touch on a couple of aspects of infrastructure about which I feel so strongly. First, mass transit. Those of you from the Puget Sound here understand Understand, painfully you understand, when I say our traffic is absolutely out of control. Tell you a story. Fast Rewind, 1988, I ran for state superintendent of public instruction. 
I'd always wanted to run for state superintendent of schools in the worst possible way. Turns out that's exactly how I ran. <laughs> um, I commuted from my home here in Olympia. Jeff's laughing, but he's still making that same damn commute. I mean, seriously, Jeff. I commuted from my home in Olympia to Seattle. And the measure of a bad day, for those of you from the north side of the Columbia River, the measure of a bad day was when the traffic first backed up at the old Rainier Brewery. Seriously, if you drive north from Olympia to Seattle today, the backup that starts at the Rainier Brewery, that's like your seventh backup in a short 29 years. Well, maybe it's not so short. Mass transit. We've got to do something about it. And the truth of the matter is, I do commute weekly. I was talking to April. Hi, April. <laughs> Who has to commute from Tacoma to Seattle uh, a few days a week. And I was telling her how bad this had gotten. I, who's here from Oregon? We got Oregon people, right? I, here in Olympia, am almost to the point where I'm going to start taking the flight out of PDX <laughs> to go to Washington, D.C. 105 miles will be quicker than 52. Literally. Literally. Traffic's terrible. And it's not just terrible in and of itself. It's terrible because of what it robs people of. It robs them from spending time with their families. It robs them from getting to work on time. It robs businesses from the opportunity to get their goods to market. There's nothing good that comes of traffic congestion. Nothing whatsoever. So last year, of course, when the sound transit package for Western Washington was on the ballot, I was thrilled to support it, frankly, because it's long overdue. It was long overdue. We need light rail, we need regional rail, and we need more bus rapid transit. But we need a lot more too. And we need the federal government to help accelerate these projects, make sure that they get completed. Because we're at the breaking point, and we've got to get more people out of their single occupant vehicles and move them efficiently so they can spend more time with their families, so they can get to their place of work. And oh, by the way, along the way, reduce carbon emissions. Second, our water infrastructure, and specifically stormwater infrastructure. Stormwater is the leading cause of water pollution in the United States of America. In many communities, 80% of the pollution is caused by stormwater runoff. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that we've defeated all point sources of pollution, but I am going to tell you that we are miles ahead on point pollution than we are in stormwater runoff. 80% of pollution in many bodies of water is caused by stormwater runoff. And we're going to absolutely need to deal with it if we're going to restore the health of the water uh, in America. And most notably in our backyard, Puget Sound. That body of water just over this hill, Capitol Lake, flows into Puget Sound. It's dying. It doesn't look like it. But you know, you can meet somebody who has cancer and you can never know it because of what's going on inside of them. That's what's happening out there. Slowly, very slowly. We, I was going to say, most of us here won't live long enough to see the death, but I look out at this audience and there are some of you that will live long enough to see it. It will become incapable of sustaining life. Incapable of sustaining life. It is becoming incapable of sustaining life. Seven species of salmon have been listed because of the health of that water. Seven. And as a consequence of the absence of food stock, the orca, that incredibly iconic species. Think in your head. Close your eyes. See that orca breach the water. Is there anything more fantastic than seeing an orca breach the water? Is there anything that better captures the importance of the Puget Sound to our region? It is the heart of our economy, of our recreation, and more importantly, it is the heart of our self-identity. This is who we are. For literally thousands of years, the salmon that swam in it sustained the people of the Northwest, the indigenous people, Native Americans. That's why they're called on the western side, the fish people. And that body of water is dying. You cannot 
save the orca. If you do not save the salmon, you cannot save the salmon. If you do not save the sound, and you cannot save the sound if you don't do something about stormwater. Right. Period. Right. Full stop. So, guess who's going to be introducing a couple of stormwater bills in the Congress? <laughs> Finally, let me say this. We can never, ever, 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 ever stop selling the problem statement on climate change. Ever. We can never stop selling it. We have a majority of the public with us now. In fact, somewhat clear majority. But we don't yet have a majority of the public in Washington State who believes that they're personally affected by climate change yet. That's also measured. We can never stop selling the number of people who believe this is a problem. The higher the number, the better. The higher the number, the easier it will be to get solutions. The higher the number, the harder it will be for them to do harm. And truth of the matter is that the measures that we are going to have to take, let's not, let's not look at this through rose-colored glasses. This isn't going to be easy. we got to get the carbon pricing. We have to get the carbon pricing. If any of you think that's going to be easy, you're wrong. This is going to be hard. It's also the right thing to do. So we have to always sell the problem statement. Now, it's up to us to run with this. Frankly, I don't think it matters who what figurehead occupies the corner office of the EPA or the Department of Energy or the Department of Interior. It's up to us. And what will it require? Properly funding our transportation system, educating, inspiring our next generation, our future innovators, engineers, and scientists, making smart choices as consumers as to the products and services we consume and buy, making sure our trade agreements take into account the impacts on the environment, finding new ways just to cut down on waste, and we absolutely need to invest, absolutely, in the cleanup of our bodies of water of national significance like the Puget Sound. That's what I get excited about. I, I get excited about it. Makes that 2,320 mile, one mile commute each way twice a week pale in comparison to the importance of the objective. And we can do so much at the local level, frankly. I wanna call out Governor Inslee, who is here later today, here later today, and all the leadership that he's providing in this space always has. We're well positioned here in our state. We're lucky he has been at this since before it was the popular thing to do. Lucky as well to have Senator Merkley, who's working so hard at this across the rotunda on the other side of the U.S. Capitol. Growing up in Vancouver, Washington, I'm a native of the oldest continuously inhabited non-Indian settlement in the entire Pacific Northwest. Vancouver, Washington. I know how connected the economies of Washington and Oregon are. I'm still a Trailblazer fan, as a matter of fact. We can be partners in this effort in so many important ways. So the bottom line is we've got good people, including all of you in this room, including leaders like Governor Inslee, including leaders like Senator Merkley, and many other hardworking Americans. And as I said earlier, more importantly, we have the support of the American people. We do. They know climate change is real, and they want something done about it. They know our infrastructure needs rebuilding, and they will support the measures necessary to get it done. That's why they supported the Sound Transit. That's why they reject repeals of the gas tax that provided in part for improved public transit in the past. Abraham Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. So my friends, let's go succeed. Thank you.
inspirational stuff. Uh, we heard a lot about...